Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and thanks to uh, Jennifer, Tony, and Ernest for the opportunity to speak to you today. And I also have really enjoyed working with um, Rich Sherwood, Tatsu Hashimoto, and Charlie O'Donnell on this project. And Charlie is here, and I think he'd be happy to answer any questions as well as, uh, as me. And what I've tried to do today is to give you a, a view into how new computational methods and new kinds of computational horsepower can solve certain kinds of problems in biology. And the problem we're going to begin with is a really fascinating mystery. Right, the fascinating mystery is that actually, even though there are hundreds of thousands of cognate motifs for a transcription factor or where it could bind in the genome, in fact, less than 5% of them are typically occupied. And we really don't know why. And we also know, however, it's controlled because the same transcription factor typically is bound differentially in two different cell types, even though this motif is shared. So what we're going to explore today is a way to approach this problem and see if we can discover some of the rules that dictate how transcription factor binding is condition specific. And I'm going to begin by introducing the idea of a pioneer transcription factor. A pioneer transcription factor is a special kind of transcription factor that has the property that can bind to closed chromatin. Now, many of you are familiar that DNA is basically wound up on these spools called nucleosomes, and they actually can condense and protect DNA from binding by proteins. And pioneer transcription factors have the unusual property that they can bind to closed chromatin. So in the past, these kinds of factors have been found in small numbers, handfuls. They're characterized typically by in-depth molecular biology studies. And so a question we had was, was there a way computationally to discover large numbers of these factors, or at least discover a larger set of these factors, from direct computational analysis of high-throughput data? And that's the journey we're going to embark upon now. I'm going to start my talk with the, the conclusion slide. So at the end, you can hold me to these conclusions, right? So I'm going, to, I'm going to approach four claims in my talk today. The first is that a new methodology called protein interaction quantitation can predict TF binding, transcription factor binding, from DNA-seq data. That's claim one. Claim two is that PIQ can identify pioneer factors that regulate chromatin opening, de novo. Claim three that certain of these pioneer transcription factors are actually directional, a fact that wasn't known. That means that they actually open up chromatin in one direction and not the other direction. And finally, that there are settler factors that follow along in the wake of these pioneer factors that sort of act like bulldozers opening up the chromatin, and these settler factors bind to the genome and affect regulatory control. So these are the four claims I'm going to make today. But before I begin, I'd like to discuss uh, the basic methodology of DNA-seq. The idea is this. If you have the genome, it's going to be occupied by a set of proteins. And what we would like to do in a single experiment is to discover the entire protein occupancy of the genome. Now, many of you have looked at ChIP-seq data and other kinds of data before. I know typically you do this one factor at a time. But it would be really great if we could actually discover the entire protein occupancy of the genome, or at least approximate it in a single experiment. And so the insight here is that if we take um, <clears throat> a nuclear extract and expose it to a cutting enzyme, DNA is one, it's going to cut the DNA wherever it's exposed. And what's going to happen is the proteins are going to cast shadows on the genome. And if we could somehow deconvolve those shadows and look at what's going on with the DNA-seq signal, we'd be able to figure out where in the genome particular factors bound, as shown here in the cartoon in the bottom, where both histones and individual regulatory proteins are casting shadows causing reads not to be present. Mind you, what's going on is that wherever there is a cut, we can read. Where there is no cut, we cannot read. So we're going to get so-called hypersensitive data wherever there are cuts. Here are some meta plots of what different factors do in terms of their binding profiles, plus or minus 200 bases from where the cognate motif is. And you can see that each factor has its own particular profile, or that it leaves on the genome. And so we can learn these automatically. Part of PIQ is learning these profiles without being given the profiles. And these look really great, right, because they're actually the amalgamation of thousands and thousands of such events aligned at the motifs. And down here is the typical meta profile for CTCF, 
Uh, those of you can see if the CTCF binding site is here, we actually have CTCF organizing histone occupancy along the genome. Unfortunately, we have a small problem, right, which is that our read density isn't that high. And this, which is barely visible to you, is the actual read density of a typical CTCF binding site. So we need new computational methods to be able to recover where these proteins are binding based upon very, very sparse data. So the idea then is that we're going to take our input genome, we're going to start with, we start today with 733 motifs approximately. Now we're using 1,000, over 1,000. We're going to scan the genome, and wherever there are matches, those are possible binding sites for motif sensitive uh, transcription factors. And then we, well, what we want to do is to take the profiles you just saw on the last slide, match them against the input data, which is very sparse, and make predictions about which ones of these motifs are occupied. So the input to the algorithm is a genome sequence, a set of motifs, and DNA seq data from one or more experiments. We automatically infer these profiles, and we output for every single motif occurrence of all the different factors a probability that they're bound or not. Okay? So that's the essence of the algorithm. Now, PIQ was designed specifically to handle this low coverage and noisy data that we're coping with, to integrate multiple experiments to build statistical power, and to scale to the whole mammalian genome. It really isn't any good if we can only do this over small windows. And we're getting our high spatial accuracy through the use of motifs, and we want to have very good worst case behavior. And I'll talk a little bit about that later on. OK. So part of the challenge of modeling this kind of binding to the genome is establishing a relevant baseline. That is, along the genome, we have reads that are occurring in a certain, certain positions. And what we would like to do is to figure out what is the latent rate of read production that normally would occur at that position in the genome, which relates to whether it's open or closed. So we're going to make an assumption here to help fill in the missing data. What we're going to assume is that we can um, establish a correlation between bases based solely upon how far apart they are in the genome, up to 400 bases. And based upon that stationary correlation structure in the genome, we can build a model of what the base level emissions across the genome are. In a way, a rough approximation of this is, how do you build a model of the unoccupied genome so then you can put on top of it the profiles that you're seeing to see whether or not you're getting extra hypersensitivity from the binding of a particular factor, OK? And we model this with a <clears throat> multivariate normal log rates and produce a resulting rate uh, which is going to be sampled to produce the counts at a particular base position. And so to determine if a particular factor is bound at a particular motif, what we'll do is we'll do a log <coughs> likelihood ratio test with and without the binding profile of that particular factor put on top of the native underlying base production of reads at that location. So the model is going to learn all of this automatically. And the essential idea is that this integrated model is going to take multiple sources of evidence. It's going to take evidence from the profiles that we learn automatically that are motif or sequence specific. It's going to take information from multiple experiments and the correlation between them to help build strength. So we learn a correlation matrix across all the experiments so we can help build strength across them. The other thing that's really interesting is that instead of treating the opposite strand reads in the same exact framework, we actually take the positive strand and the negative strand reads and treat them as the same as two independent experiments. So we learn the correlation structure between the reads, and thus we automatically learn how long the fragments are by the correlation structure we learn. The other thing that we do is that the score of a particular motif against the genome is often used as a prior for figuring out whether or not something binds or not. Instead of using that score in a raw form, we actually automatically learn a per experiment and per motif monotone function that maps the PWM score into a prior for binding at a particular location. So these different components are very helpful in improving the performance of PIQ. Um, 
just to give you an idea of the computational scaling, we're <coughs> running this on mammalian sized genomes, typically 1,500 motifs or so we're scanning for, and simultaneously determining whether they're occupied or not. This, of course, represents hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of individual binding sites across the genome. We're using a window size of 400 bases uh, for computing our uh, a stationary correlation structure across the genome. And what we do now is we actually go out to the Amazon cloud and we buy <coughs> all of our compute time on a bid basis because we're using a lot of compute time. And so we typically will buy 80 CPUs or more. And it takes one day of clock time to do a set of experiments, but that equates to about 80 days of CPU time. So the kinds of experiments that we're doing now actually are going beyond what we can do on a cluster because we're running multiple jobs like this simultaneously. So it's very, very compute intensive. And we have our own little structure for managing this inside of a cloud. Since this is a computational venue, um, I thought I'd just show you a little bit about that. In the Elastic Block Store on EC2, we put in uh, the data for the job. There's a master that actually organizes all the slaves that run on this, and all of this state on the right-hand side is transitory because uh, we can lose our job if we get outbid by somebody else on EC2. But suffice to say, EBS serves as a stable repository for the state of the job and any intermediate results. And it works very, very effectively for us. I mean, we have fallen in love with the cloud only because the kinds of jobs that we can run now uh, in this context, we wouldn't be able to do at all. And I think that as molecular biology progresses and you're dealing with individual experiments that have 200 million reads, you really need to be able to commit you know, months, if not years, of CPU time to analyze one experiment. Our current methodologies, which I'm not discussing today, uh, take almost a CPU year per experiment to run. Okay, so my first claim was that we could detect the binding and be competitive with um, with other methodologies. And as you can see, if we compare PIQ to other methods for analyzing DNA-seq data, CI centipede and DGF, the area under the um, receiver operating curve is much better for PIQ. In fact, it's so good that in certain cases, we are tempted to use it as a substitute for CHIP-seq. That is, in a single DNA-seq experiment, we can begin to learn the entire protein occupancy of the genome, all of the regulators, and begin to use that to predict regulatory architecture. But there's some caveats. Caveats are important. For certain factors, the correspondence with CHIP-seq bound sites is, has an AUC of 0.9 and above. Um, but the, a, a factor is DNA-seq detectable only if it has a strong binding motif, it binds in DNA's accessible regions, and it has a strong binding affinity uh, to protect from DNAs. So about 75 of the 302 factors I showed you on the slide before are strongly detectable uh, via this methodology. Okay, so that's claim one. I hope I've supported that. Let's go on to claim two, that we can identify these pioneer factors. So recall that a typical transcription factor has hundreds of thousands of possible binding sites. We'd like to locate the ones it actually does bind to. And to look at this, we did a time series of endodermal development and did DNA-seq experiments at all these time points. We asked a very simple question, which is, in that time series, where does the chromatin open? And what factors are sitting there? And can we, from that time series data, recover information about the structure of this? So, we embarked upon the systematic pioneer identification, and the figure at the bottom, I think, is indicative of the way we approach this, which is that if you have a time zero and then another time, if you don't get any pioneering activity, the chromatin's not going to open up and become accessible. On the other hand, if you do have pioneering activity, you'll see the factor land and clear out uh, the, the chromatin to make it accessible. Uh, it's also possible that certain pioneers are not going to open chromatin in the same way, and we won't be able to detect them. And furthermore, obviously, we can only detect pioneers that are active in a particular lineage or cells that we look at. So that said, we 
established a number of metrics to look at these different properties of the cell. And one such metric we call the Pioneer Index, which is an index that measures how much chromatin opens from one time to the next time by a factor. We also looked at the, uh, what's what we call the Chromatin Opening Index score, which is just how much chromatin is open around a given factor that's bound to the genome. We found these two were highly concordant, which allowed us to use individual experiments to estimate Pioneer activity. We also found, as you might expect, that around pioneers, they're very social creatures, right? There are a lot of other factors that bind around them by what we call a social index score. But we're gonna focus on the chromatin opening index score to actually determine which factors are pioneers and which ones are not. So these um, pioneer transcription factors have identifiable profiles. We found 120 of them. And you can see the one that we, ones that we identified have these profiles that have elevated hypersensitivity around them, whereas other factors do not have this elevated hypersensitivity. So we can classify the factors into pioneers and non-pioneers. Now, I know what you're thinking, which is, okay, that's all great computational analysis. Is it really true? So what we did was we designed a um, toll-based insertion vector where we could place a punitive pioneer or non-pioneer motif in it and see whether or not it enabled retinoic acid receptor to bind to a construct that would turn on GFP. And we did a number of controls to ensure, for example, that simply adding the pioneer along with this motif did not turn on GFP because we wanted to eliminate the possibility that it itself was an enhancer of gene activity. It was simply opening up the chromatin. And what you can see from this assay is that uh, <coughs> eight of the nine uh, pioneer factors that we tested actually did turn on GFP in a context where the genome was presumably closed. So this provides us further support for the idea that these factors are opening up the genome and enabling other factors to bind to turn on genes. Now, I showed you this slide before, but I want to return to it for a moment. Can anybody see something unusual about this? about any of these profiles here, like for queso or NRF1? Well, they're asymmetric. And so because these are non-palindromic motifs, you can orient them. And it turns out that they actually have more hypersensitivity on one side than the other. And we thought, aha, perhaps these things are directional. Maybe they're serving like genomic parentheses in a way. And they're opening up the genome in one direction, but not the other direction. So we went back and tested our um, system using the same toll insertion vector, putting the motif into this construct, both in the forward and the reverse direction. And what you would expect, you'd get differential activation of GFP depending on which way that motif was oriented, right? Because it would open up the chromatin one way versus the other way. And we selected these by <coughs> computing asymmetry asymmetry index score and pick the ones that were high in that score. So when we did that, uh, we found that in fact, we could see the directional activity of these directional pioneers. That is, when the motifs were put in the proper orientation with respect to their directional activity, they did activate GFP, and when they put in the reverse direction, they did not. So this further helped us substantiate the idea that um, these factors uh, were directional in their activity. And we'll come back to another support of that claim in a moment. So that's claim three. And finally, claim four is we came up with, some <clears throat> with an analysis that looked at factors that depended upon chromatin being open to bind, but that did not open it themselves. And so we thought that these might be settler factors. They depended upon open chromatin, but they did not act like bulldozers and open the chromatin up all on their lonesome. So in order to validate this, what we did was we built a dominant negative assay. So we took a pioneer and we chopped off its head, right? We chopped off its activating domain, the part that we thought was mediating the opening activity and only left the DNA binding domain. So the theory was when you express this dominant negative pioneer, it's going to reduce hypersensitivity in the region 
and also reduce the binding of proximal settlers. All right? So when we did this and we expressed this dominant negative version, both of NFYA and NRF1, which are two of the pioneers that I talked to you about earlier, what happens is the net hypersensitivity is substantially reduced around those sites natively in the genome. Okay? The other thing we wanted to see was whether or not when we expressed these dominant negative constructs for directional pioneers, it would eliminate or reduce the binding of downstream events. So here we go. Here's NFYA, which is a directional pioneer. We turn on the dominant negative, and when the binding site that's native in the genome is downstream of the NFYA site, binding is reduced. However, when the binding site for, in this case, CMIC, is upstream, it is not reduced. So this is further support of the idea that these are actually operating directionally. The final thing I'd like to say is it appears that pioneers appear to be conserved between human and mouse. So we looked at the chromatin opening index of factors and their homologs, uh, both in <clears throat> uh, mouse and human, and they're highly correlated. So finally, I'd just like to say that, I'd like to go back to my original claims, that PIQ is a highly accurate means of predicting TF binding from DNA-seq data. We can identify novel pioneer factors that regulate chromatin opening. Certain of these pioneer factors are directional. And finally, that the settler factors follow the pioneer factor binding, and loss of pioneer activity can reduce the binding of settler factors. So what I've presented to you today is a multi-level model of gene regulation, where the pioneer factors are coming in, opening up chromatin in defined regions, enabling other factors to bind, which helps us understand why only a small fraction of the cognate motifs of a given factor are normally occupied. All right, I'll stop right there and take any questions. Thank you very much. Yes, Martha? Um, we did not look for peptide signatures. We did look at the profiles and we clustered them in multi-dimensions. You can actually tell the family of the transcription factor from its protection profile. So there's some mechanism there. The other thing I should say, obviously, following on Martha's very nice talk this morning about factor binding specificities, that when you are looking at motifs alone, you can't tell all the time which specific factor is binding because you can look, look at families of factors that bind the same cognate motif. So what we produce is an estimate of which family members are binding at particular locations in the genome. But that's a good question, Martha. Any other questions? Yes. The uh, IPS annotation on there that you didn't talk about kind of caught my eye. Do you have data of on pioneer factors playing mouse EF cell IPS induction? No, we have not looked at IPS induction. Um, but presumably we would see things like OC4 and some of the other uh, ox, ox, non ox, so forth factors um, as pioneers, but we're not sure. But they've been reported to be pioneers in the past. Y yes? Uh, how important do you think is this mechanism for opening uh, chromatin? Is this, you said it's the dominant mode of activity or some fraction? <laughs> I wish I knew the answer to that question. How, your question is how important is this mechanism for opening chromatin? Um, it appears to us it does open chromatin. It appears to explain a lot of it. Um, what we're doing now is we're actually looking at the following question, which is, I was telling you about which pioneers appear to act in a static situation. At a particular time point, which factors are opening chromatin? A secondary question you might ask is, if you have a set of time points of a particular experimental treatment or of a developmental time series, between two time points, when you have differential activity, can you tell me which factors are really important for that particular differential activity in that particular lineage. And so now we're discovering a secondary set of factors that appear to modulate the activity of the primary factors that I've discussed here. Any questions? Great. Okay. Let's, thank, let's you very much. thank Dave again.